In the aftermath of this month's failed talks between the Russian, American and NATO representatives in Geneva, everybody is talking like they believe that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a foregone conclusion. From the officials of the US State Department, the Pentagon and NATO to the intelligence agencies and the media, nearly everyone is talking as though they haven't the slightest doubt that Russia intends to invade. But I believe that they're mistaken and that Russia has an entirely different strategy. This report is an expanded version of the article I first published in my Trend Compass newsletter on 14th January. Here I will offer a broader context to these events, as well as my own guess about Russia's next moves. If my hunch is right, Russia's coming actions will likely take the collective West off guard, and the consequences could prove hugely detrimental, particularly for our friends in the global banking cartel. They, in particular, might want to pay attention to this report. Let's briefly summarize the recent history of relations between Russia and the West. In February 1990, the Soviet Union was still intact and Germany was still divided. Western Germany was a NATO member and East Germany was a communist Soviet bloc country. The US government requested Soviet Union's cooperation on their plan for German reunification. If the Soviets withdrew from East Germany, US State Secretary James Baker promised that NATO would not expand one inch eastward. This commitment was repeated by other US officials as well as by Britain's Prime Minister John Major. The Soviets withdrew and Germany was reunited, but the Western powers broke their promise and over the next 27 years the alliance expanded many inches eastward, adding 14 new member states, all of them in the direction of Russia's borders. A glance at the before and after maps is enough to see why Russia feels concerned about this. Today, the alliance is in the process of absorbing Ukraine and Georgia with a view to them eventually becoming full members. For Russia, this represents a red line, but NATO insists that the alliance membership is open to any European state in a position to further the principles of the North Atlantic Treaty and to contribute to the security of the North Atlantic area. In spite of the fact that the communist bloc no longer exists, the NATO regards Russia as an enemy and maintains a hostile stance towards her. Over the years, NATO has tripled its military forces near Russia's borders. As Professor Stephen Cohen noted already in 2016, the last time there was this kind of Western military hostile force on Russia's borders was when Nazis invaded Russia in 1941. There has never been anything like this. During the 40-year Cold War, there was this vast buffer zone that ran from Soviet borders all the way to Berlin. There were no NATO or American troops there. This is a very radical departure on the part of the Obama administration. Indeed, NATO has continued to stockpile heavy weaponry, building up permanent logistics infra infrastructure and deploying more and more troops along Russia's borders. The US has built missile defense bases in Romania and Poland, deployed nuclear bomb capable aircraft close to Russia, and allocated more than $8 billion of US taxpayer money to upgrade their arsenal of B-61 nuclear bombs kept in the United States and five other NATO member nations. At a NATO summit in Brussels in June 2021, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg boasted about the alliance's plan to continue this buildup. We have now implemented the biggest reinforcements of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War and will continue to strengthen our collective defense with high readiness, more troops and increased investment in our defense. Perhaps the most important thing we have done is that for the first time in NATO's history, we have combat ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance. New battle groups are deployed to the Baltic countries and Poland, and we have tripled the size of NATO readiness force. In 2017, Ukraine's parliament passed legislation making its membership in NATO a strategic policy objective. In 2019, this objective was enshrined in Ukraine's constitution. And while her full, full membership in NATO is ostensibly not on the table, the alliance is clearly advancing to fully integrating Ukraine as a partner, which will bring NATO right on to Russia's doorstep. The cooperation between Ukraine and NATO began already in 1994. In July 2013, that's right, five months before the Euromind coup kicked off, NATO started to implement the Defense Education Enhancement Program, or DEEP, in Ukraine, 
nothing short of a comprehensive overhaul of Ukraine's military training and educational institutions. From 2013 through 2018, it deployed more than 350 training teams focused not only on educating military officers, but also a new generation of Ukrainian diplomats and high-level officials, as well as press officers. This is important to keep in mind because when Ukraine's high-level officials speak to Western audiences in Polish prose and fluent English, usually these are not democratically elected representatives of the people of Ukraine, but rather NATO's own trained monkeys reciting well-rehearsed talking points. Arming and training of Ukraine's military has accelerated since the Maidan coup. Many of the new training centers have been intended to become full military bases in the future. In 2015, Ukraine formally became a member of NATO's support and procurement agency, enabling it to directly procure weapons and military technology. Furthermore, at least two of Ukraine's military units have been certified as eligible for deployment as part of NATO Response Force. A press release of one of these regiments stated that the service members have come a hard way to join the NATO family and met all of the alliance's requirements to fulfill combat missions along with foreign partners. NATO family, that press release must have come straight from the deep Wordsmith Academy. But not all programs can be shown in the family album. Recently, Yahoo News broke a story about a covert program to train Ukrainian paramilitary units on US territory. The program has been run by the CIA's ground department since 2015 as part of its expanded anti-Russia effort. The United States and Britain have also been active building up Ukraine's naval capabilities. In June 2021, Great Britain and Ukraine signed a deal for the construction of warships for Ukraine's navy and building of two new naval bases, one in the Black Sea and one in the Sea of Azov. The deal was signed aboard of a British Navy destroyer in the presence of the British ambassador to, to Ukraine, Melinda Simmons, and Admiral Tony Radakin. Thus, for 30 years now, Western powers have relentlessly built up military assets in Eastern Europe and supported one color revolution after another, all along Russia's borders, turning all of her neighboring countries into adversaries with loyalties in the West. Throughout this time, Russia's responses have only been reactive, not proactive. But now Russia gave Western powers a clear signal that it will no longer tolerate further violations of its security concerns. On Friday, 17 December 2021, the Kremlin released two draft treaties formulating a radical new security arrangement. The documents were presented to the American government and to NATO. They address the aspects of US and NATO activities in Europe which jeopardize Russia's security and set out a series of strikingly tough demands, including a stop to NATO's expansion and a rollback of NATO from Eastern Europe. The text of the treaties apparently stunned their recipients, yet nobody seems to think that the Russians are bluffing. As Kremlin's unofficial spokesman Dmitry Kiselyov put it, Russia has made an offer to the United States which it cannot turn down. The moment of truth has arrived. Russian government made it clear that it expected a prompt resolution of the matter and the talks between the parties were organized in Geneva on the 10th through 13th January of this year, 2022. After the first day's talks with the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov bluntly stated that for us it is absolutely mandatory to make sure that Ukraine never, never, ever becomes a member of NATO. He further explained that we presented to the Americans in the most detailed way possible the logic and substance of our proposals, explained why obtaining legal guarantees from NATO not to expand is an absolute imperative, explained why we absolutely must receive legal guarantees on the non-deployment of the strike systems on Russia's borders, and why we are raising the question about NATO abandoning by and large the material development of the territory of states which joined the alliance after 1997. These demands may seem extreme, but for more than two centuries now, Russia has suffered multiple invasions and color revolutions directed from Western centers of power. In 1941, Germany invaded Russia, resulting in massive devastation and more than 16 million Russian lives lost. Today, Russia is facing a hostile alliance of 30 nations, three of which are nuclear powers, two of which are open to using nuclear first strike policy and one of which actually dropped nuclear bombs on the civilian population of its wartime adversary. 
It should not be difficult to understand why Russia has serious security concerns. Accordingly, Sergei Rybakov made it clear that if the US and NATO proceeded with the new weapons deployments close to Russia's borders, that Russia would respond with military technical measures that will inevitably and unavoidably damage the security of the US and its European allies. This was indeed stunningly tough talk from the Russian representative. Longtime Russia analyst Gilbert Doktorov thought that if accepted in their present form, these treaties would represent a total capitulation by the United States over everything four successive administrations have tried to achieve to contain Russia. It therefore no surprised no one that the talks in Geneva failed. The day after the talks ended, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, held a long press conference in which he said that the Russian side is expecting a concrete answer to its security proposal, but that Moscow's patience has come to an end. During that conference, Lavrov made a reference to the proverb that the Russians take a very long time to harness their horses, but once the horses are harnessed, they ride swiftly, he said. We have been harnessing for a very long time, and now it's time for us to go. I believe I know where the Russians will ride next, but before I venture their guest, it should be useful for us to set all these developments into their proper and all-important historical perspective. The first thing that's important to understand is that to this day, the American geopolitics are driven by the vestigial interests of the late British Empire. In the early 20th century, as the British Empire began to collapse, its stakeholders, the international banking cartel based in the city of London, moved to infiltrate and co-opt the governing institutions of the United States and hijack its wealth and military power in continued pursuit of their own imperial ambitions. For over a century now, their overarching imperative has been to maintain their hegemony over the Eurasian landmass. Halford Mackinder explicitly formulated this objective. In Democratic Ideals and Reality, he wrote, Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island controls the world. By world island, Mackinder meant Eurasia. As the empire builders infiltrated the US, they took their policy objectives with them, including the imperative of ruling Eastern Europe to control Eurasia. In, the, in his 1997 book, The Grand Chessboard, the empire's court intellectuals, Bignev Brzezinski, articulated this objective as America's own priority and explained the rationale behind it. For America, the chief geopolitical price is Eurasia. Eurasia is the globe's largest continent and is geopolitically axial. A power that dominates Eurasia would control two of the world's three most advanced and economically productive regions. About 70% of the world's people live in Eurasia, and most of the world's physical wealth is there as well, both in its enterprises and underneath its soil. Eurasia accounts for 60% of the world's GDP and about three quarters of the world's known energy resources. The most immediate task is to make certain that no state or combination of state gains the capacity to expel the United States from Eurasia, or even to diminish significantly its decisive arbitration role. These were not just idle musings of an ivory tower professor. Brzezinski was a powerful policy advisor to many presidential administrations, including those of John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan, and Jimmy Carter. His thinking was key in shaping the US foreign policy for the last five decades. The imperial obsession with dominating Eurasia has remained entrenched until today, as reaffirmed once more in August of 2018 by the US Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Wes Mitchell, in a briefing to the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee. On that occasion, Mitchell made it explicit that the central aim of the administration's foreign policy is to defend US domination of Eurasian landmass as the foremost US national security interest and to prepare the nation for the challenge. Mitchell also said that the administration was working with our close ally, the UK, to form an international coalition for coordinating efforts in this field. But unfortunately for the empire builders, over the last 20 years, Russia has emerged as the dominant power in Eastern Europe and a major obstacle to their global ambitions. It's a near certainty that the empire will do everything in its considerable power to eliminate this obstacle. This is the context that explains NATO expansion, military deployment, and support for multiple color revolutions along Russia's borders. It is the dying empire's struggle to retain its supremacy and destroy any rival that can obstruct its full-spectrum dominance. 
There can be little doubt that Russia's leadership understands NATO expansion precisely in that context. Our next question is, where does this obsession with dominating Eurasia come from? What's the reason behind the need for conquest and hegemony? As historian Ramsey McMullen suggested, in order for us to arrive at a correct understanding of history, we need to understand the motivations of groups and individuals who created that history. After more than two decades of permanent wars, we can part with the illusion that our armies are fighting to spread democracy and freedom, and that our leaders lose any sleep over human rights of exotic peoples in faraway lands. The struggle is and always has been over resources, and that includes the local labor force, because those resources represent money good collateral. Western financial system has been absolutely starved for high quality collateral, and Eurasia is awash with it. The problem with the Western mon monetary system is that it tends to pile debt on top of more debt, leveraging the system until it collapses, almost permanently careening from crisis to crisis. It can only be stable while it is growing, but to continue growing, it must continue adding quality collateral. So how much collateral do they need? A few years back, we got a glimpse of the magnitude of the problem. The appendix to Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee's quarterly refunding presentation showed that in 2013, the total demand for high quality collateral needed to stabilize the system was estimated at $11.3 trillion. That figure surely grew very considerably in the ensuing nine years. Incidentally, the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, or TBAC, is one of the most powerful agencies in the US government. Even though most people are not even aware of this committee, it is the hip where the banking power joins political power. It is staffed by bankers and not by people's representatives. Some people believe it's the committee that really rules the nation. When TBAC tells the government that they need more collateral, the government listens. If all this seems a bit ambiguous, perhaps a concrete example can help us understand the way military conquest translates into high-quality collateral. In 2016, the Chilcot inquiry into the British role in Iraq war revealed that six months after the 2003 invasion, a consortium of Western banks led by JP Morgan extended a $2.5 billion loan to help Iraq's economic recovery. The loan was extremely favorable and risk-free to the bankers as it mortgaged Iraqi oil exports. Perhaps it was only a coincidence that JP Morgan was also one of the biggest backers of the Bush-Cheney election campaign. Once in power, the Bush administration delivered the Iraq invasion. JP Morgan also richly rewarded Sir Tony Blair's inestimable contribution to making that war possible. At the end of his term as British Prime Minister, the bank hired him as an advisor on a $5 million per year contract. The JP Morgan loan to Iraq was just one instance where a large loan conjured out of thin air and secured by the conquered nation's natural wealth would have to be paid back with interest. You can multiply such deals perhaps a hundredfold or more if you can deploy armies to resource-rich regions in the world and your corporations get the first row access to the business of exploiting those resources. All that high-quality collateral can then be leveraged up so that the credit expansion process can continue for a long time before the need arises to liberate new collateral. Contrast JP Morgan's good fortune in Iraq two decades ago with some of the present developments in the region. For example, Iran is presently building a huge natural gas hub project that will bring natural gas from the Caspian region to Europe. Just one of the recently developed gas fields, the Chalus, is estimated to hold enough reserves to supply more than 50% of European gas demand for at least 20 years. But with the rise of Russia and China as the new dominant powers in Eurasia, such projects are now off limits to Western banks and corporations. Today, the key players developing this energy infrastructure are Russia's Gazprom and Transneft, China's CNPC and Sinuk, and Iran's Kepco. From the banker's point of view, that's a lot of high quality collateral in the wrong hands. Clearly, the conflict between East and West is not over ideology or a bit of territory. It is about hegemony over resource-rich regions of the world, and that makes the two sides' positions intractable. The Russians clearly understand this, which is why they presented the Western powers with a set of demands so tough that they certainly knew they would be rejected. It seems that Russia really does intend to respond with military technical measures that will jeopardize Western powers' security. 
So far, however, even among the Russian analysts, nobody seems to know what's coming next. Most of the experts and officials in the West seem convinced that the Russians will invade Ukraine, but I don't think this will happen. The media also made much of Russia's deputy foreign minister's remark that they don't exclude military deployment of assets in Cuba or Venezuela, which is certainly possible longer term. A few analysts, including Scott Ritter, suggested that R Russians might deploy medium short range missiles targeting European capitals with nuclear cap capable warheads. The Kremlin will probably increase pressure on the US and NATO countries in multiple ways, but my own hunch is that their first focus will be on the Persian Gulf region, which is strategically of huge importance to the West, but where American position is incre increasingly fragile. Russia can further fragilize their position without the need to fire a single shot. In doing so, it would strike the West where it is most vulnerable, its capital markets. It would merely need to implement military technical measures in support of friendly regimes in the Middle East, primarily Iran. It is becoming clear that Iran is becoming an important component of China's One Belt, One Road agenda and that it is being set up as the cornerstone of their security architecture in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. These developments also have full support from Russia. On 27 March last year, Iran sa signed a comprehensive 25-year cooperation plan with China, which included cultural, diplomatic, economic and military cooperation. On 17 September, Iran became a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO. Iran has also signed various security agreements with Russia and is in the process of negotiating a 20-year cooperation agreement modeled on the Iran-China agreement. On 11 December 2021, Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Saeed Khatibzadeh stated that, like the 25-year cooperation roadmap we have developed with China, we can do the same with major neighboring countries. Clearly, the Iranians who have pledged to throw the United States out of the region have been increasingly confident in asserting their regional influence. Of course, the greatest challenge to Iran's regional policy and security is the presence of American troops and military bases surrounding Iran, as this map shows. The map shows the deployment of US forces as at January 2020. I've only crudely updated it to account for US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Incidentally, this map illustrates another reason why the hold on Afghanistan was so important to the empire. Iran's partnership with Russia and China will ultimately tip the military balance of power, so it was perhaps no coincidence that Iran's President Ebrahim Raisi's visit to Moscow was scheduled for Wednesday, 19 January 2022, only days after the failed talks between Russia and the US in Geneva. In announcing the meetings, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that it was a very important meeting and added that undoubtedly, among international issues, the one such as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and the security of the Persian Gulf will be discussed in the meeting of the presidents of Iran and Russia. At the opening of his meeting with President Putin, Mr. Raisi said that the relationship between the two nations should be permanent and strategic. In his address to the Russia Duma, he said that the strategy of domination has now failed, the United States is in its weakest position, and the power of independent nations is experiencing historic growth. President Raisi's visit to Moscow was followed two days later by military exercises of Russian, Iranian and Chinese navies in the Sea of Oman, not far from the strategically pivotal Straits of Hormuz. The three powers show of force was an un unmistakable hint that there's a new sheriff in town and that the days of unchallenged US dominance in the region are over. Thus, the military technical measures Russia announced if the US and NATO did not agree to her draft treaties will likely be made in support of forces that are already fighting to drive the Western powers out of the region. Iran is obviously the prime candidate for such support, and during his visit in Moscow, President Raisi did not fail to underscore Iran's credibility and commitment to this objective, in stating, we have been resisting the Americans for 40 years. Together with its proxy forces in Iraq, Iran will make it increasingly difficult and costly for the US to secure its control of the region. Russia will not need to confront the US militarily. It will simply be worn down and eventually pushed out in a similar way that they were pushed out from Afghanistan. 
For the Western nations, which are already facing a worsening energy crisis, this could indeed jeopardize their security. But it could also have severe adverse effects on their economies and capital markets. Paradoxically, however, for that same reason, the Western powers might not advertise that their control is slipping away. They will likely take their blows in silence and keep a brave face for as long as possible to keep the markets convinced that their revenue streams from the Middle East are and will remain secure forever. I first published what I laid out here in my daily Trend Compass newsletter on, on Thursday, 14th January, titled Only a Hunch, Will It Be the Persian Gulf? I can confess this really is only a hunch based on my own reading of the situation. However, as events have played out over the last two weeks, I am increasingly confident that my hunch was correct. At the same time, however, I couldn't begin to guess how exactly the events might play out. For one thing, the uncertainty is probably part of the equation. Russia's current gambit is very radical departure from the status quo, and it should be to her advantage to keep her adversaries guessing and distracted in the wrong places. Indeed, it is possible that nothing obvious will happen over the coming weeks. All the same, we should not underestimate the changes that are already taking place. As they compound, they will precipitate a collapse of the global order that has become entrenched for more than two centuries now. Russia will probably not invade Ukraine and Russian bombs won't start raining down on European cities, but the pain will be real and the changes will be felt most strongly in Western capital and commodities markets. Over time, we'll see a very substantial rise in interest rates, which will ultimately push stock prices into a bear market. Unlike the limited and short-lived corrections we've experienced over the last four decades, a real bear market could be drastic and last a very long time. It is what happened in the United States after the 1920s bubble and in Japan after the 1980s bubble. In both cases, we saw stock prices decline by over 80%. The US stock market took over 25 years to fully recover, while the Nikkei never recovered after fully 32 years since the 1989 peak. We are also likely to see a continued acceleration of inflation in most, if not all, of the G7 nations, as well as a gradual worsening of the energy crisis, which could drag on for years. Energy prices could rise far beyond today's levels. Even without factoring the conflict with Russia and based on the accelerating depletion of conventional oil reserves, the UK Ministry of Defense predicted in 2012 that the price of crude oil would rise to $500 per barrel by 2040. Similar trends will likely materialize in other commodities, including metals and agricultural products, fueling a sustained commodity supercycle that many analysts have been predicting in the recent years. It would be impossible to predict the timing and magnitude of all these events any length of time into the future. But the one thing we know for sure is that large-scale price events invariably unfold as trends which tend to span many months and even years. For traders and investors, the most reliable way to navigate trends is to use high-quality systematic trend-following strategies. This is precisely the kind of decision support we provide through iSystem Trend Compass reports that reliably deliver daily trend signals on more than 200 different financial and commodities markets. We've used the iSystem since 2003, and it has proven remarkably effective and completely reliable. For nearly 20 years now, iSystem strategies have not missed a major market trend even once, and as our audited track record shows, it has outperformed even the world's leading trend-following hedge funds. For reliable, opinion-free market guidance, consider subscribing to iSystem Trend Compass daily reports by going to iSystem-TF.com or by dropping us an email to trendcompass at iSystem-TF.com. Monthly subscriptions start from €85 Euros per month and the first month test drive is always free of charge with no strings of any kind attached. With that, I'll conclude today's report. Please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. Until the next time, please keep well, stay free, and I'll see you soon.